Okay, let's get right into it. We're focusing on delirium management today, right. and we're really trying to move past the general guidelines and into the uh, the sharp, specific choices you have to make right at the moment of prescription. Exactly. Delirium is just such a pervasive and, and severe issue. You see it in the intensive care unit, the emergency department, general wards. It's a huge complication of being in the hospital. Indeed. And delirium really is an acute cognitive dysfunction. It's defined by those, you know, fluctuating levels of attention and consciousness that make it so challenging to manage clinically. We know the non-pharmacological interventions are the first line. That's the foundation of care. Mm -hmm. But when those don't control the symptoms, when you get the agitation, the emotional ability, the, the really profound sleep-wake cycle problems, you need medication that works. Exactly. That's when antipsychotics come in to manage those behavioral emergencies. Mm -hmm. And we really need to look at two of the most common atypical agents, dolanzapine and ketupine. So let's start with the context. For any provider listening, why does managing delirium effectively carry such, such high stakes? The stakes are immense. If you look at the big picture, delirium can affect up to, what, 50% of hospitalized older patients? 50%? That's a staggering number. It is. And we have to be clear, this is not just temporary confusion. It is directly associated with a measurable increase in mortality. And beyond that mortality link, what else is at stake? Well, delirium dramatically prolongs hospital stays. And maybe the most distressing part is that it's a significant independent risk factor for long-term cognitive impairment. You mean like dementia? Accelerated dementia post-discharge, yes. Why did the field pivot towards these atypical or second-generation antipsychotics in the first place? That pivot was really driven by safety concerns, specifically with the older traditional agents like haloperidol. Right. Atypicals have a much lower perceived risk of causing those extra pyramidal symptoms, you know, EPS, mm. things like acute dystonia or tardive dyskinesia. And avoiding that in a fragile older patient is a huge goal. A major goal. Okay, understood. But if both olanzapine and quetiapine are atypical agents, why is it so important to differentiate them? Why can't you just substitute one for the other? Because they have fundamentally distinct pharmacokinetic properties. Mm -hmm. I mean, they differ in absorption, in potency, in their side effect profile. So treating them as equivalents is a mistake. It compromises immediate patient safety and their whole recovery. We have to look past that simple atypical label. Okay, let's focus on those differences, starting with something very practical, delivery systems. Flexibility here is offer the first thing you look for in an agitated patient. What makes olanzapine so versatile? Olanzapine gives you three essential formulations. You've got your standard oral tablet, the specialized orally disintegrating tablet. And the injectable. And critically, the intramuscular injectable. That trio offers incredible adaptability in an acute situation. So when does that intramuscular formulation become absolutely essential for a clinician? It's the go-to for rapid intervention. It's essential when you're trying to control severe, acute, hyperactive agitation, and time is critical. You mean when a patient is a danger to themselves or others? Exactly. When you need control in minutes, not hours. And what about those orally disintegrating tablets? They solve a very common problem, don't they? They absolutely do. They're crucial for patients with dysphagia, you know, difficulty swallowing, or maybe for patients who are only cooperating some of the time. So they can't pocket the pill. Right. If they're pocketing or spitting out a standard pill, the orally disintegrating tablet ensures you get reliable absorption. It minimizes missed doses. Now, in complete contrast, what's the major limitation with quetiapine's delivery that really restricts its use in those acute, severe settings? Quetiapine is strictly oral administration only. There's no effective or approved intramuscular formulation. So that means you need a patient who is cooperative. A cooperative patient and a functional gastrointestinal tract. I see the immediate problem there. If your patient is severely agitated, refusing everything by mouth, quetiapine is off the table for acute stabilization. Exactly right. Okay. That one restriction makes it unsuitable for managing that acute, severe, hyperactive state. It forces your hand to other agents when you need rapid control. All right, let's move on to efficacy and potency. Delivery aside, which agent gives us a better pharmacological effect for that acute symptom control? Lanzapine is, I mean, it's undeniably the superior choice for rapid control of acute agitation and psychosis. Its receptor profile gives it immediate impact. But when speed is the priority. When speed and reliable symptom reduction are the priority, 
olanzapine is the front runner. And where does that leave quetiapine? Quetiapine is generally, um, it's more for managing mild agitation or most commonly for promoting some sedation at night. It's on a totally different timeline. How different, how does the speed of onset compare, really? Olanzapine's onset is rapid. Especially with the intramuscular route, you'll often see an effect in 15 to 30 minutes. Okay. And quetiapine. Substantially slower. And it requires titration, you know, increasing the dose over days to get a true, consistent antipsychotic effect. Let's talk more about that dose response curve because I think this is where a lot of providers can get tripped up. What is the fundamental difference in how they act at low versus high doses? Well, olanzapine delivers robust antipsychotic effects even at pretty modest initial doses. Oh, okay. That's because of its high affinity for dopamine and serotonin receptors. Its effect is pretty stable across the therapeutic range. And quetiapine is the opposite. Its effect is highly dose dependent. It acts more like a, a chemical switch. Mm. At low doses, let's say 25 to 100 milligrams. The doses we often see used for delirium. Exactly. At those doses, it's acting primarily as a profound sedative. This is because it's a powerful histamine or H1 re receptor antagonist, like a strong antihistamine. So you're basically just using a side effect as the main effect. Precisely. It's true antipsychotic properties, the ones that block dopamine and serotonin receptors, they only really emerge at much higher doses. We're talking 300 milligrams or more. And that really limits its use when you need rapid stabilization. Okay, we've covered efficacy. Now for the balancing act, safety and side effects. For providers, what are the main metabolic risks with olanzapine that require careful monitoring? Olanzapine has a strong association with metabolic dysregulation. Clinicians have to be vigilant for a significant weight gain with longer use. But more urgently in the hospital, you have to watch for acute glucose dysregulation. Hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia. Yeah. It can complicate diabetes management or even trigger new onset problems. That's a big concern. Now, for immediate safety, what's the critical warning about intramuscular olanzapine that just cannot be overlooked? This is a vital patient safety point. You have to use extreme caution when intramuscular olanzapine is co-administered with benzodiazepines, like lorazepam. Why is that combination so dangerous? It's linked to an elevated and, frankly, life-threatening risk of severe respiratory depression and cardiorespiratory arrest. So you use one or the other? You generally use one class or the other, or you space the administration very carefully and monitor their breathing constantly. Switching over to quetipine, what are the primary cardiovascular concerns we need to track? With quetipine, you have a demonstrably higher risk of orthostatic hypotension. Its blockade of alpha-1 receptors causes vasodilation, which leads to these dangerous drops in blood pressure when a patient stands up. And there's also a cardiac risk, right? Yes, the potential for cardiac conduction issues, specifically QT prolongation, which can increase the risk for serious arrhythmias. Let's connect Quetipine's strong sedation back to the patient's recovery. How does that daytime sleepiness actually undermine their progress? That strong sedation creates a really debilitating hangover effect. And that somnolence, it actively hinders the patient's ability to participate in physical therapy in cognitive reorientation. So they can't get out of bed, they can't engage. Exactly. And if they can't do that, they fail mobility goals, the hospital stay gets longer, and the delirium itself can be extended. Okay, let's synthesize this. Let's build a clear clinical decision framework. You're at the bedside, you have a patient with severe hyperactive agitation, maybe they can't take anything orally. What's the preferred therapy? In that urgent scenario, Olanzapine or haloperidol are still the preferred agents. You'd pick olanzapine when you want to minimize the risk of those extrapyramidal symptoms and you're accepting the metabolic risk trade-off. And if a provider chooses intramuscular olanzapine, what is the mandatory safety step? You absolutely must monitor the patient's respiratory status and blood pressure very closely for several hours, especially if they've received any other sedatives. That follow-up is non-negotiable. Okay, conversely, when is quetiapine the right thoughtful choice in a delirium setting? Quetiapine is a reasonable choice for, say, mild nocturnal agitation or for dedicated nighttime dosing. It can promote sleep and help restore that critical sleep-wake cycle. But even when using it for sleep, you have to be careful. Absolutely. You must vigilantly monitor that patient the next day for orthostasis and for that risk of profound daytime oversedation. The goal is recovery not exchanging confusion for incapacitation. Finally, what are the three indispensable principles for using any antipsychotic in delirium? Number one has to be about dosing. Principle one is start low, go slow, always. Initiate at the lowest possible effective dose. The goal is symptom control, 
not deep sedation. Principle two, duration of treatment. Frequent reassessment. You have to evaluate the need for the medication every single day. As the underlying issue resolves, you have to challenge whether the antipsychotic is still needed. And the final principle, which I think is often neglected, is getting off the medication. Prompt cessation. These drugs should be stopped immediately once the acute delirium resolves and the patient is stable. They are not maintenance medications for delirium. So to summarize the choice for you, olanzapine offers superior flexibility and potent rapid control for acute agitation. Quetiapine is better suited for stable patients with mild agitation and maybe some insomnia as long as they can tolerate the oral route and the sedative load. The ultimate key is moving toward that calculated informed decision. Mm -hmm. So clinicians have to prioritize three factors every single time the patient's ability to swallow, the severity and urgency of their agitation right now, and their specific risk profile metabolic versus cardiovascular.